our speaker. Um, this is Susan Tolson. She's the Chief Growth and Advocacy <laughs> Chief Growth Growth and Advocacy <laughs> Officer. Man, I love being a professional speaker, guys. It's great. <laughs> With the U of I Community Credit Union. Um, over the last three and a half years, she's led the team in implementing the Financial Wellbeing for All strategy and has established the U of I Community Credit Union Partnership Program which won the Louise Herring Award in 2022, which recognizes credit unions that do an extraordinary job incorporating credit union philosophy into daily operations. Additionally, she's been a friend of Research Park for years and has generously spoken on this topic for the last two years. So please welcome Susan. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Research Park. I have a real passion for financial education. I, I haven't always had a passion. There was a lot of my adult years where thinking about money, thinking about banking did nothing but stress me out. But once you overcome and you learn a little bit, it really does help and it alleviates a lot of issues when you have an understanding of how the game of banking works. And there is a game, just like any other things. So I'm excited to be here. This is an open dialogue. So if I'm ever sharing something that you have a question about or you want to add on to, this is your session, and I would highly welcome that. Also, I want to give a shout out to my two amazing colleagues, Sherry Shannon, who's actually the director of the partnership program, and under her leadership, in 2024, earned a diamond award in the industry. It's the highest level of board in the way that we lead with mission and doing more good within our community. And Liz Welsh right there, and they're responsible, well, they're, they're an awesome twosome, and they're responsible for the gifts that you have before you as well. So glad you guys are here. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the connection of financial health, physical health, and mental health. And I really kind of want to spend a little bit of time on this because, you know, it's often thought that having money solves all your problems and leads to happiness. While that's not necessarily true, having enough finances to be secure in your everyday life can truly create overall well-being. The, having the ability to afford essential expenses and additional funds for vacations, outings, emergencies, can truly create confidence and a sense of relief. However, when you are in that space of financial trouble, living paycheck to paycheck, not so fun fact, the majority of America is living paycheck to paycheck. So that's a real thing. When you don't have the monies for unforeseen expenses to cover your health, can also be impacted. Financial stressors have been found to directly correlate with poor physical and mental well-being. And you know this, right? When you don't have enough money to do life, you're stressed, man. And that creates anxiety. And when you're anxious, then you're not really taking care of your body either. It really becomes a spiral. So to me, I think it's really important to understand how your finances and your health are truly interconnected. Okay, not so fun facts. Uh, money and health directly impact one another and the results can manifest in ways. So here are a few stats that highlight that. So 60% of Americans are anxious about their finances. Young Americans are also more likely to experience financial anxiety. And what is the average, does anybody know what the average student loan debt is? Y'all know? Okay, so it's about 50 grand. And $50,000 when you're graduating with a degree and you may or may not already have a job and you're starting out, that's kind of stressful to start thinking about those things. Um, four out of five employers say that employees' financial issues are impacting job performance. That is absolutely the reason why the U of I Credit Union started the partnership program. We're literally taking the credit union into the workplace and educating on these topics and helping employees have enough money for basic needs. 
Um, so this is why it's so important. So debt-related financial stress increases developing depression by 51%. I am so sorry to be a downer right now, but I promise if you hang out, we're gonna give you some tips on how to overcome this. Um, it can manifest through physical issues like we've talked about, and money problems can lead to unhealthy coping mechanisms. So the irony is, oftentimes, when you're stressed out about money, they, when you get money, you have this like sudden wealth syndrome where you're like, well, I just got a paycheck and I finally have money, so I want to go do the things. But without having a real awareness about your expenses and some of your budgeting, that also can put you in a really bad spot because it can spiral you down. So there's such an irony about it doesn't matter where you are and how much you're making, it truly is about learning to live within those means or, what I love, cultivate a side hustle. So there's two ways you can think of budgeting, and we're going to talk about that, and that's either living within the dollars that you make or realizing you spend more than that, and so you're thinking creatively, entrepreneurially, on ways to bring in additional revenue streams. And we'll touch more about that. Okay, so what is financial health? Why is it important? It really refers to the state of your finances, such as do you have savings, and how about your retirement fund? You know, it's a fascinating thing, because right now you guys are in a space of expansion, you guys are building your careers, you're building your personal lives, and that's an expensive time, right? But also, the decisions that you make today can make the difference between having to work till you're 70, or maybe working until you're 55 or 60. And that's a real thing, and often the choices that you're making in your 20s or 30s can make a decision or can really impact that. So having this ability of preparing for retirement, avoiding too much debt. Now, not all debt is bad. Home ownership is the fastest way to generational wealth, and most people cannot afford a mortgage without being in debt. That's a type of debt that is an asset that will continue to increase, and that type of debt makes a lot of sense. Credit card debt, because you don't have an emergency fund or you're not living within your means, that's the kind of debt that actually makes it more expensive to do life moving forward. So stabilizing your credit score, which we're going to talk a little bit about that, these are all areas that really lead to true financial health and that can really help your overall well-being. Okay, so this is kind of interesting. I, I wanted to do a little bit of research on different type of spending habits. So impulsive buying, impulsive buyers. See, these are our common spending habits. So if I'm reading about one of these and you relate, raise your hand if you're great with them. And I'll do the same. So if you're an impulsive shopper, it's usually an instant or unplanned purchase where the emotions take over rationality. And hence, we end up with products we don't really need. We may want those pair of shoes, but do we need those pair of shoes? That's a question. So how many of you in the audience are a little bit of an impulsive buyer? Me too. That's my jam. Anyone go to the TJ Maxx? Yeah. TJ Maxx. It's real. It's real. Brands are always finding ways to make online shopping easier. How many of you have bought something on Amazon and then a box comes to your door within days and you're like, what the heck is in that box? <laughs> you may be an impulsive shopper. <laughs> FOMO shopping, fear of missing out, is a psychological phenomenon when a person experiences anxiety about missing an important event. Oh, guys, currently dooming millennials and Gen Z. Well, and I'm a Gen Xer, so I think it gets me too. FOMO shopping is on the rise, especially due to social media. So who likes that Instagram reel that's telling you something to buy? Yeah, it's impulsive and interesting at the same time, and social media does a beautiful job of creating social proof. So now you're like, oh my, what 
kids are doing this. I also see this manifesting in wanting to go to those concerts. Like, anyone see Taylor Swift? You gotta flip them. You can make bank flipping those tickets. What was that? If you buy the Taylor Swift tickets for any show, you can flip them and make a ton of money. That's why. That's okay. <laughs> I like the way he's thinking about it. That's an entrepreneurial idea right there. <laughs> that's how you just flip the spending game. Now you're buying, it becomes an asset, but then you have to sell it. Well, you got to think ahead and only buy tickets that you know will go up or tickets that you actually want to attend the show. I love that. That's a way of increasing revenue and buying the Taylor Swift tickets at the same time. What, right there. Yeah. Or Taylor really brought out the conversation. What else? Buying you some of those actions. Are illegal. <laughs> <laughs> so, do it at your own risk. I'm not either advocating or supporting these ideas that could be illegal. Thank you for that. Yeah. All right. Okay. Let's. Let's. How about deal shopping? Who's a sucker for a good deal? Me too, man. I can go into a store, and the ones that get me buy one. Get the second half off. Well, oh my gosh, now I'm buying in sets of two. <laughs> That's a real problem. It kind of goes back to impulsive shopping a little bit and being intentional about some of your spending. So here's another one, boredom shopping. I honestly think that's when you're scrolling on Instagram, to be honest with you, you get a little bored. Who likes, who shops when they're bored? You know, we want that dopamine hit, we're looking for a way to leverage. Your brain, by the way, did you know, it hates boredom and it craves stimulation. And it will make you tempting to encourage you to sh spend it in your shopping cart. So these are things to be aware of because really, Brands have created marketing to tap into either your impulsivity, your FOMO, a deal, suckers, and those boredom shopping. How about, any of you gone to Disney, Walt Disney World? Okay. Have you ridden the ride, like, you know, that elevator that drops, that spooky ride? And if you go to the, any of the thrill rides, right, so now you just gotta hit a dopamine, when you try to exit, do you exit back where the masses are? No, they make you exit in a gift shop. And they take that picture of you, and you're like, oh, look at my friend's face, look at us, we're gonna buy that. Does anyone ever frame those things? No, but they get you in the impulsivity of the moment. Disney is genius, and everything is a marketing opportunity. Guess what? All brands that are existing today are geniuses that way. All right, so there's a little bit about your common spending habits. So here are some tips on how to counteract it. Shopping online. Leave it in your cart for at least two days. And if you remember it and come back to it, you're not being impulsive. And I guarantee you're going to remember what that box is. So that's a very simple tip. Now, I believe in spending. I know that seems counterintuitive, but you're going to see a budget that I'll share with you all. And it actually gives you fun money because y'all are going to be working hard. You're already working hard. You're interns and you're going to school. You can't just live, save money, and never spend on fun things. So one of the things I want to introduce is a splurge fund. Anybody have a splurge fund? Oh, Brian has a splurge fund. I love that. So if you know that shopping makes you happy, going to concerts make you happy, seeing Taylor Swift makes you happy, or not, get a splurge fund. And that way you're intentionally putting money in there with no judgment, no shame, and you spend that money however you want. You spend that money. I don't care how you spend that money. I just don't want you to spend money that is intended for your rent on your impulsive shopping. But if you have yourself a splurge fund and you want to go get some fabulous shoes, because I've been eyeballing those shoes over there. You get those shoes. She's got the most killer shoes. I'm afraid if I walked in those, I would roll an ankle, but they are so fabulous. I love them. Splurge fund. 
All right. Every year, I try to find something that's happening in society that's kind of like a thing. Y'all, freaking sports betting? OMG. This is some scary stuff, man. Where are my male adults ages 18 to 26? You guys are being targeted. Where we're being targeted for male, you guys are being targeted at FanDuel. Oh yeah, you know. It's there. It's real. So let me give you a little bit. As more states are legalizing gambling, online sports books have spent billions courting the next generations of betters. Guys, they're spending billions of dollars on this so that they know the ROI on that is even greater. And now, as sports bet, sports apps, man, you can bet 24-7 and have access to placing wagers. Addiction groups say that more young people are seeking help than ever before. One out of three U.S. adults say they bet on sports games. And you know what they're targeting? Boredom. Last year, the Super Bowl, well, it wasn't last year, just February, um, $28 billion was spent on that Super Bowl game alone. So Brian and I were doing a sidebar on this, right? Because I'm like, bonkers, this is crazy. The other thing about betting that's really getting to your brains, it's the dopamine hit. They know they, this is like when you win, and you're designed to win. You're like, they want you to win a percentage of the time, but you're gonna lose most of the time. Just having awareness on this. So Brian and I were talking, and he was like, well, what about those games? I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, like, fourth night. I'm like, tell me about that. And he said, well, you know, you can get it for free, but if you want the latest and greatest skin, you're gonna spend like five bucks on that stuff. I'm like, suckers. They know how to do it, don't they? They know how to give you something for nothing, but if you're gonna really maximize your experience, they want a little bit of money. So I'm not a fourth night girl, right? Surprise. I'm a grandma. But you know what I like? Daily cross, crosswords. Okay, I see some nods. And you know the thing about those daily crosswords? Is they give you the free stuff, but you never win on the free stuff. And once you give up your tokens, then they're like, oh, just buy some more tokens. And I'm like, no, I'm not buying the tokens. Because I know if I buy the tokens, it's just like a cupcake, I'm gonna want more. So for me, I know I'm not good at moderating. I'm not a moderator. So I just abstain. So then every day they're like, hey, come play the daily crosswords. So they give me just enough to get about 80% of that puzzle. Does anyone ever finish the puzzle without paying for anything? Tell me, has anyone in here finished a puzzle without paying all the money? See, it's all designed to do that. So this is a caution, it's just awareness that the brands, the betting community is large. And if they're targeting you, they're targeting you because they know you're gonna make them lots of money. So just be very mindful of that. And Brian, thanks for the tip. It's not just sports betting, it's also games in general. All right, well that was fun. Any questions? Yes. Um, about the splurging on things, how would you you guys speak a little louder than that. About the splurging, how would you avoid splurging on like food? Because I feel like I just like that. Like, I need to eat. <laughs> you know, I, I have an observation. I have, I'm going to get to your question. I have an observation for that. Have you ever gone to Aldi or the Walmart? That's great. Yeah, same. And have you looked at the cars there? You're going to see cars from you know, a basic Civic or an older Toyota, and you're gonna see luxury brands like BMWs and, and Mercedes-Benz. I actually think your eating out or food can be a very large expense, and I'm a big believer in Costco, and if you're a student, Costco with friends. It could be a whole new thing. Instead of going out to a bar, let's Costco with friends. And I'm kind of making that up right now. I don't like this. Because you're never going to eat all those chicken breasts. But if you Costco with friends, you just 
cut it up, and you get a pass, and you get a pass, and together, you all just save money. And with that money, you go spend other things. I'm going to get to you. The other thing is, if you don't want to spend the max quantity, you still Costco, I still think with friends, and then you go to the Aldi. That's what I do. You'll see me there at the Costco and at the Aldi. Now, if I'm going to splurge, I'm splurging on a nice dinner wrap. And I try to do that in a way that there's no guilt, no shame. And I'm going to share a little bit of budgeting tips on how to do that. But I think the majority of time, your body and your pocketbook will thank you if you actually spend more time in your kitchen instead of ordering out. So here's another thing. Sometimes you don't have time, and I appreciate that too. Because you guys are stressed. You're trying to go to school, you're trying to work, and some teachers are cool, and some teachers are giving you god-awful amounts of homework. So you guys are in a stressful period of time where time management is very important. And sometimes you're going to make a decision to do, what do we call that, DoorDash. And you're going to make a decision because you need to eat and you're still studying, can you do the DoorDash? And if that's your reality, then I say you've got a budget for it. And we're going to talk a little bit more about budgeting, so I hope that helps you. I actually love the idea of Costco with your friends. I do. I can't let it go. Liz and Sherry, I kind of want to do it with the two of you. Okay. Kathy, wherever she is, Kathy's an amazing cook. She, I would love to Costco with friends and then go to her house and help her make a dinner. Because she's amazing. All right, so let's talk a little bit about money matters. Oh my gosh, this has been a lot of fun, guys. Can you tell I don't get out of the credit union that often? So I'm enjoying you all so much. So financial goals, short and long term. You're never too young to have goals, period. I, I think that's really important. And whatever that goal looks like, maybe you're saving to pay off your credit card, maybe you're saving for that summer vacation. I'm not sure what it is, but I think it is important to have financial goals. And it happens and changes every year in your life. I like to think financial education isn't like a destination, it's a journey. Because at every stage of your life, you're going to be in a different place, and your needs and wants are going to look very differently. But if you get into the habit today of starting to establish some of those goals, and then, oh my gosh, celebrate when you achieve a goal, that's a dopamine hit that you really want to continue to capitalize on. I actually say to people that even if you don't have tons of money to save, get in the habit of saving five bucks. You guys, y'all got five bucks or a buck. Because it's not really about the amount of money, it's about building the muscle of savings. Spending plan. Oh, we're going to talk about that. I, I'm, true transparency, this is Sherry's plan. I'm going to speak to it. And I know she's going to jump in because I'll probably murder it at some point. And then decreasing your spending or increasing your income. I am not a financial educator. The three of us are all coaches. I am not a big person about you're going to save your Starbucks to prosperity, all right? No, I'm not going to do that. If you really want that Starbucks for 10 bucks, you go have that. That's fine, as long as it fits in your budget. But I am a big believer in the side hustle. I've always had a side hustle in some way, and I think now there are more ways to make money legally <laughs> than ever before. <laughs> he left, so I really said that. Because, but, <laughs> Where do you go? Um, more expenses than your income, then you cut, right? You cut. And but I also believe start increasing your spending line. And then knowing when to ask for help. Guys, I I'm going to put a plug in for credit unions in general, but the mission of credit unions is to provide trusted financial education, and pretty much any credit union in the country can do that. We're really fun, and we're here to help as well. Okay, so let's talk about a spending plan. This is Sherry's, and I love it. You know why I love this so much? It's kind of a macro way of looking at it. This is a spending plan if you're 40 or younger, and like I said earlier, that's about the age where you are in building mode, right? You're in building, you've got student debt, so these are your percentiles. And this is, this is the money you have after taxes, this is real dollars, right? These are your real dollars that are coming in. 70% should be your living expenses. 
It should be your rent. It should be your car payment. It should be your food. Not eating out food, but the food that you spend. It's your gas. It's your electric bill. It's your child care costs. It's everything you need to do life comes out of that 70% of your living expense. 20% should be, um, there's debts and savings. That's kind of a wonky, isn't it? Yes. So I actually, it's 10% you want to be able to have for your savings, that's a smaller amount, and 20% is your fun money. 20% of your income should be on shoes. 20% should be on restaurants. 20% should be whatever you choose to do that. And you can also be saving for a longer term goal. Any questions on this? I'll show another one for when you're about 40-ish or older, right? What I love about this is it's fluid and it changes and it all fits within a macro level. Back in the day, when I was getting started, they were like, write down all your expenses. Keep an Excel spreadsheet. And if that is your jam, do it, because you're going to adhere to it. It's not mine. I'm really good at looking at my money at a macro level and knowing where it goes and keeping that track. Now, real deal, not every month is like this. Some months, you might actually be spending more money in your bad money and not as much in your, in your savings. And that's no judgment. That's okay. The next month is a new month and you can change with that. When you think about savings, that's also your 401k. Sherry and I have a debate. And I'm gonna share another spending plan with you too. Our debate is, should people have for, a, for an emergency savings? I say $1,000. And I say 500 <laughs> because you can always grow it. She's right. A thousand is a good place to have, but when you're celebrating and you're talking about short or long-term goals, know that that first hundred, that first 250, that first 500, that first thousand, you all should celebrate that. And these are the dollars in your emergency fund that goes to your entire um, running over something and it get blown out. Now, it's not the maintenance on your car because you should be budgeting for that. But it's the emergency things. It's your refrigerator cracking out and you need to have that. So this is more of a broken out version and 50% when you're kind of done with your student loan debt, these are good goals to have because 50% of your expenses should live in that category. All right, now here's a word of warning. When you graduate from college, they pull your credit report. We're gonna talk about credit, because that is such a game. They pull your credit report and they look at your debt to income. So that's how many debts and how much money you come in. Banks, auto, auto dealerships, they want to maximize how much they can lend to you. And it's not like they know something about your lifestyle. They're literally just doing the math. So a word of warning, when you graduate and start living life and buying things, know your budget. Know how much you like to go on vacation. If in your mind you think, I can afford a $400 car payment, but a bank or a credit union or an auto dealership is saying, you can really afford $750. Know that they don't know something you don't. They're just trying to maximize the loan they're going to give you. Oftentimes, it's those purchases that get us sideways. It's overspending on a car you can't afford or buying a home you can't afford. So if you keep the 50, 30, 20 in mind and know that, you're going to be a savvy consumer and save yourself a lot of mental anguish moving forward. Any questions on the 50-30 or the 70-20-10? So you were talking about budgeting for uh, infrequent expenses like car maintenance. Um, if that is not going to be a part of a monthly budget, how are you dividing your savings category to a lot? That's a great question. So he's saying, okay, well, if car maintenance is something you should be planning for, how do you do that? 
And there's a couple of ways to do it. You can either look at it in your 50% or you can look at it as a savings goal. There's both, there's no wrong answer on that. So one of the things the credit union offers, I'm a very visual person. I have, I think I have now 10 different savings accounts and they're all labeled something different. And I now have a brand new car, so I don't have a, a maintenance account because I have a brand new car. But before I traded it in, you bet I had an account for car breakdowns because I knew at 125,000 miles, I was probably at that point. So in my mind, I don't like my savings to go into one savings account. I like to have emergency. I have a Christmas club event club, um, account. I have, what else do I have? I have presents. I have all kinds of things. Now, I do not give the same dollars to each one of those. They do vary, but depending on how you do it, some people have one, one savings account, they put all their dollars in, and they replenish it. I do think that even if you're a minimalist, you want to separate your emergency fund. Does that make sense? So even if you have a savings account, and you know, rule of thumb, you want to have a savings account for three to five months of your expenses. God forbid something happens and you lose your job, or if you want to fire your job, you have some assets there that could cover you. Now when I say that, your expenses that you're trying to cover for are the 50%. Because if you're in a space where you don't have employment, we're really not going to worry about fund money for now, and we're not going to worry about savings. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about your three to five months, that I think everybody, including you all, should have at least a $500 emergency fund. Anything else? It, it becomes very empowering. There's this kind of thought that, you know, oh, I, you know, I'm not materialistic. Well, and I would challenge that because when you have resources and means, it does sometimes make the difference between you staying in a job you're not really happy with or leaving a job if you want to make a change. It can make the difference between I don't know if I really want to stay in Illinois, although I think champagne or is like, why would you want to move because it's so awesome? But maybe you want to move to D.C. or San Francisco. But if you don't really have that savings, it becomes a little more daunting to do it. So to me, this is where the empowerment comes back from a finance in, in, um, point. You know, Kathy, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to give you a shout out. So Kathy, um, single mom, phenomenal mom, so well beloved in our community, it's always edifying others. She's quite savvy financially. And I saw a post that she made several years ago, I hope you don't mind me sharing, that she paid off her mortgage. That's a big freaking deal, man. And she did that as a single parent. And I, to this day, am so inspired by that. And the sense of empowerment and the confidence that this woman has moving forward and what she role modeled to her children I think is freaking awesome. All right, so now we're going to talk about the credit score. Who knows about credit scores? Okay, cool, cool. So think of a credit score as your money GPA. Because really that's what this is all about. So credit score is really the one that really determines how, if one, if you're going to get a loan, and two, how much that loan is going to cost. So I have a, it's also, oh yeah, guys, they're pumping credit now for jobs. Did you know that? Right? And it's all about character, collateral, capacity, and they're seeing what your values are. And how you spend your money and allocate that is a reflection of it. So it could affect your dream job, it could affect your apartment as well. And here's why you should care. First one, I, I'm gonna give you, I wanna, I wanna pl play a little role play here. Let's say I'm gonna buy a car. And my credit score is 580. And Liz is going to buy a, credit, a car, and her credit score is 820. So I'm 580. She's 820. Who's going to get a better experience? Me or Liz? Raise your hand if it's me. Raise your hand if it's Liz. I don't know. Guess what? What? 
I heard they changed like a lot of metrics in the way that they determine how your credit score actually attributes to like getting. We'll talk about that. But you are see he is like a squeaky wheel. He's like right ahead of me. <laughs> the the difference is from a 580, if they're gonna give me a loan or an 820, you will not see a difference. You won't see it. So if your credit score is low, here's where they see the difference is the cost of that loan. And I don't know if you guys could see that, but the difference between somebody with better credit or not from a consumer side is how much that loan is going to cost. Do you want to know why they jack up the interest rate? They're making more money out of you because they're setting it aside because they're expecting you to potentially not pay your loan. So you're actually having to pay more money because they're actually saying, I'm not so sure. Susan, you're going to afford that loan and you're going to pay it. So I need to make a little bit more. So if I have to charge that loan off, I can afford to do it. So the reality is, if your credit score is good or not great, your experience will not change. This goes to your FICO. This is how things are computed. There are some algorithms that are now recognizing unique things like Vanguard. But by and large, most banks and credit unions follow this FICO scoring model. All right, so the biggest part of it, payment history. Pay on time. Even if you get hit a late payment and you're late, it's going to affect 35% of your score. 30% is the amount owed. So basically, if you have credit cards to the tune of $3,000, you want to make sure you never have more than $1,000 that is being spent. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. You guys are staying with me. I'm very impressed. Length of credit history. So my whole thing is, once you get a credit card, don't close the credit card because that's going to hurt your length of history. 10% is your type of credit. So they do like to see a mortgage loan, credit cards, a variety of different lending can impact it. And here's a funny one. New credit sometimes can hurt you. But it only happens temporarily and it comes back. All right, I didn't spend a ton of time on this. Any questions about credit scores? Yes. Like. So if you are in the range of 740 to 790, like you show, that, is, is there a difference between 740 and 790? It is, that's a great question. If you're at 740, which is considered excellent credit, 740 or above, is there a difference between 740 and 790? There wouldn't be at the credit union. We recognize 740 or higher, and now credit scores go up to all the way to 850. And there is no difference. You are considered a paper. You will get the best interest rates on things. So that is a really, that's a very good question. Any any other questions? Yes. Uh, so for a uh, you can pretty much balance your credit card of how much you owe um, in debt. But for like um, car loans or anything like that, once you get them, it, it's going to take a while, like I don't know, one to two years or even three years to get to even that 30% that is usually recommended. That's a great question, and that's not going to hurt you because that's called an installment loan. Your mortgage or your car loan, which is a fixed payment, you need to focus on paying on time, and that's your your what you need to focus on. Where you can get really sideways on the amounts owed are these lines of credit that are unsecured, uh, like a prime line, or credit cards. That's where you really want to stay underneath that 30%. Honestly, guys, I actually say 20% or 10%. And the fastest way to increase your amounts owed is sometimes just getting more credit that you're just sitting there. And maybe you're only charging at a gas station once a year, right? Just to keep it active. Anything else? That's a great question. Yes? I think you might have just answered this, but how much of your credit line should you use to, like, I guess how much does the percentage of your credit line use affect your score? Anything over 30% hurts you. And if you're looking at Credit Karma, we have a 
um, an education algorithm within our website too. Most banks offer that now, and they'll warn you when it looks like your credit utilization, what you're saying, if you're using too much of your credit line, it will start to give you kind of a red light or a yellow light or green light. I actually say this is 30%. If you get over 30%, it hurts. But because it's so easy sometimes to get over, especially if you do not have an emergency fund, oftentimes credit cards become your emergency fund. So you want to make sure you stay within that 20% or under. Any other? Yes? That's a great question. So what are the pros and cons of credit, right? That's what we're looking at. First of all, I don't believe in annual fees. I really don't. Uh, there's a lot of good products out there that have really strong either low interest rates or rewards or cash back, and you don't have an annual fee, right? That's one thing to look at. I, if you are somebody that carries a balance, you want to look for a credit card with a lower interest rate. If you are somebody that pays off every month, now you're in the land of maximizing. I would want rewards on points, or I want cash back. And now you're becoming a savvy consumer. I actually, my youngest who graduated from here, her, he and his uh, fiance have a travel card. And they prioritize all their spend, and they're hoping to actually have enough money in points to fly to Thailand for their wedding. And it's a great goal, and I keep reminding him, as long as you pay it off every month, then that works for you, and that's what's working for him. Does that help you? Yes, Brian? Question on credit cards. So let's say you have gotten above the uh, amount owed than you would want to, and somewhere in the 50, 60, maybe you can max it out. Provided you can get a loan from a bank or credit union, is that a better option than to transfer it and consolidate all the debt? That's a great question. So if you found yourself and you've maxed out your credit cards, come to a credit union, period. Credit unions are here to take care of consumers, and we're going to work with you on either a balance transfer into a lower interest rate or maybe a debt consolidation loan. And what I like about debt consolidation loans, it's a fixed payment every single month. But when I'm seeing, I'm seeing interest rates as high as 30 40%, and if you're carrying any kind of balance at, you know, higher than 30%, that's going to be very hard to pay that down. And so, but life happens, right? And sometimes that happens. That's when, remember how I said earlier, you need to know when to ask for help? If you've had medical debt, I mean, the number one reason why consumers bankrupt is because of medical debt, which really is unfortunate that our health care is designed that way. Before you make decisions like that, you do want to go visit a credit union that can help you or work with a, a certified financial coach. That's what Liz and I do. We help you try to help figure out what's the best solution. Because it truly does depend on where you are and how much money you're bringing in. Does that help? Anything else? Yes? Uh, is it true that uh, medical debt doesn't affect your credit score? No, it's not. Because if it goes into collections, that's when it drags it down. And, you know, that's, ironically, that's the same thing with your cable bill or your electric bill, too. So there are, I think, Equifax now, there's a way that you can see if you're paying your electric bill every month can help with your credit score. I think Equifax recognizes that. All three of them, TransUnion, um, Experian, or Equifax, will, will recognize the negative. So that sometimes you work so hard to make the positive, but then you have one mistake and it drops your score. You know, there's technology now in everything you do. I actually believe in setting up automatic payments for the minimum amount, and that's how you let technology work for you. Now, I also said you want to pay it off, and I think that's important. But if you do for the minimum amount, God forbid you're in the hospital, you know that that's going to be taken care of, and then if you want to pay more, you always can. Anything else? Yeah, there's some, I, you probably are familiar with this, but there's some like apps or websites or something now where you can uh, input your different bills and whatever, log in, link all the accounts, and it will start 
giving you or maybe probably also hurting your credit depending on if you pay just like normal bills like even like Netflix or something like that. That's really interesting. I've seen the apps where they help you identify, you know, when we were talking about shopping, all those apps we bought and a very quickly, but I didn't know about this. I know the credit union has an algorithm that if you want to buy a car or a home, you can literally put the price in, the interest rate, and it will let you know how this will impact your credit score and what does that look like, you know, what is your average rate. So there's a lot of tools out there right now to help you manage your money, and that could really help you, and, and that's, I'm hoping this kind of sheds a little bit of that light. So you shouldn't be intimidated by those tools. And even if you run a simulation on a loan, that's not going to hurt your credit. That they're not pulling a hard credit report on you. You can run as many simulations, and you're going to be fine with that as well. All right, yes? So I just started to build my credit report history. Yes. Um, I have a credit line, which is not high. But the thing is, sometimes I have to make big purchases, like plane tickets or, or tickets. or something of that sort. Um, and then it would definitely go over my 30% my utilization rate. I've heard that if you pay it off quick enough, that would reflect. What is your take on this? Uh, yes and yes, right? If you wait, sometimes even until that statement comes in, depending on when your bank is reporting, it could show you on the top end of maxing out your card and that will hurt you. So in my mind, if you have the ability and it's smart to cover those purchases, big purchases like airline tickets, auto, you know, those rental cars. You do want to use credit for that because it really protects your um, purchase in a way that it's not pulling out your cash money. But in my mind, you pay off that card immediately, and you have no issues. If you have the money for the for the airline ticket and you pay it on your American Airlines credit card, right? Then just go into your app and switch that money right over, and then you don't have to worry about it. Or you want to increase your line. I actually had a really good friend of mine who was super savvy with her money, and she was like, I don't know what's happening. My credit score keeps dropping, and I don't get it. Turned out she was making all of her purchases. She didn't have enough capacity, and she was paying off her bills. However, her bank, her reporting um, company with the credit card, was reporting to the, to the bureaus about a week before she made her payments. So now she just pays it off as she goes, and her credit score has bounced right back. So do you see the subtlety? So um, companies either report to the bureaus on the 1st, 15th, or 30th of the month, and here's the kicker. They're all different. So it's not like this set standard, and so depending on when your billing cycle is, it could be in the middle of that billing cycle. So I hope that helps. Any last questions before we move on? Okay. All right. So I talked about gambling, right? Because that's a, like legit, like billions of dollars being used, gaming, all of that. Guys, fraud is real. It's a real problem. This is the... This is from the federal government. This is the safest way to check your credit report. You're not going to get a credit score, but what you will have is access to TransUnion, Equifax, or Experian, and you want to pull that information, and you go to this website. I actually took a picture of it so you guys got to see what it looked like. And don't be fooled, because if you Google this, there are a couple other websites that will pop up first. And you should never have to pay to have access to your your um, credit reports. And go in there and look. Because one, I want to make sure nobody has taken your identity, including family members, which is really unfortunate that sometimes that happens. Or you've been actually taken, um, you know, victim to something. So I'm going to tell you a personal story. I now have a freeze on every single one of my bureaus. I was traveling, and I got an alert that said, hey, you just got a hard pull from Capital One. And I'm like, I don't have a Capital One credit card. And so it was like a Sunday, and I called them. And they're like, well, um, can you call back on Monday? And sure enough, Capital One called me on Monday and said, yeah, somebody was trying to steal your identity and get a venture capital card. And I was unaware of it, so they denied it. 
And then I went to annualcreditreport.com to make sure there were nothing else on my credit report that was not accurate. There wasn't, thankfully. And I just put a lock on it. They call it a freeze. Um, and now, if I want to get credit, I have to go in and physically unlock it and allow the bureaus. It takes about 24 to 48 hours. Not as convenient, but it does stop me from getting some of those silly credit cards at, at a shop, like an Ann Taylor account. <laughs> you know, there's sometimes those impulsivities to make a purchase and get money, but those interest rates get very, very high, and that gets really challenging. I think every single one of you, you want to do this before you graduate, before you're going to make any major purchase, because you don't want to have any surprises. You don't want to get a car and then be anxious what's going to be on your credit report. This actually allows you to see where you are and to ensure that there's no false information. Any questions on this? Yes. Is there a reason why you unfreeze it and refreeze it? Could you, are you able to just leave it unfrozen now that you took care of the situation? or is there? Yeah, that, I actually made the decision to keep it frozen because I talked to you about the Capital One. I had another one six months prior to that. And I had, um, this helped me, I didn't have a freeze, but I had a, uh, oh, I had a verification. There's a, and I'm not using the right terminology, so I apologize. So there's a lesser safe where they actually have to insure on the right person, but I still had the Capital One thing happen, even though I had that alert. So for me, I just went ahead and do it. Um, it has not been a challenge. I haven't had to un undo it, but if I, when to, if I get anything that had to pull my credit, sure enough, I would have to unfreeze them. And so, sure, it's a bit of a hurdle, it's a bit of a hassle. However, I don't have to worry about anyone stealing my identity. And that's a real thing. Okay, here's the other thing. Your bank's calling you. It looks like your bank's number. And they're telling you there's fraud on your account. You didn't know there was fraud on your account. And they're wanting you to give them crucial information to verify who you are. Stop. Don't do it. That's spoofing. And the fraudsters have gotten so sophisticated, they literally could use the number for your financial institution. But no financial institutions will not do that. And if you're ever in doubt, go to the website and call the number on the website. It's a lot of shifty things, and now with AI, the texts are looking more legit, the emails are looking more legit because they're running it through like ChatGPT, and they're more sophisticated. So as a consumer, you have to be really cautious. My CEO has a really great line. He basically is like, I'm not gonna trust anyone telling me I have a problem if I don't already know I have a problem. You know you have a problem if you use a debit card and you got denied at point of purchase. That's a problem. Now you have a problem. Now you call your credit card or you call your, your bank, you call your credit union. Now you have a problem. But if you don't know you already have a problem, I'm going to give you another example. Um, our CEO was talking in our annual meeting and he wanted to give a warning of fraud. And he literally was trying to find an example. And he and his wife were in the car and his wife said, Give me your credit card, I need to pay my toll. I have a $10 toll fee. I just, he's like, what are you talking about? He's like, I just got a text. And he's like, well, let me see that. And she's like, just give me your credit card. She's like, babe, I think it's fraud. And sure enough, he looked at the text, he's like, this is fraud. And then like two weeks later, the Illinois Tollway Society, Tollway, said, we would never text you because there was this whole fraud thing. Do you see how simple it is? It's so insidious, and that was low dollars. So they're thinking, oh, just pay 10 bucks. But if you get thousands of consumers paying 10 bucks, and they're just falling for it, because what's 10 bucks? Then that's how you make money. All right, you guys are being so good. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about credit unions in general. I mean, I'm partial, because I love being the U of I credit union, but of course I work there. But I do wanna talk a little bit about credit unions as a mission. For the most part, credit unions were designed to help consumers. We're not really there to help you build a big business, but we are there to help you save money or make more money. And they have partnered with other credit unions because there's 50,000 fee-free ATMs, and you've got other shared branching throughout the country as well. We have digital banking tools. All your banks should have digital banking tools. 
use them. Put alerts on there. Let you know when your checking account gets low and the funds get low. And we also include credits for monitoring. But I would think most things offer that too. We do that all fee free as well because we're here to help you grow wealth and to educate you as you go. And you guys, thank you so much for attending today and being such a great audience. If you ever have any questions, that's my email and that's my cell phone. So you're welcome to call me or email me anytime. And I just really appreciate being here with you guys today. So thank you.